Hey, you're watching BS Works episode number three, and I'm Scott Purdue with Flywire, and I've got Juan, Juan Valerio, and Rod. Rod Level. He's from Austra Australia, so uh, it's uh, six p.m. as I as we film this, it's six p.m. my time, Central. So it's three in the afternoon for Juan. What time is it in uh, Australia tomorrow? I 8.30. 8.30 tomorrow. That's exactly right. 8.30 <laughs> what? In the morning? Or in yeah, 8.30 in the morning. Yeah. That's... <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Juan goes to from L.A. to Sydney quite a bit. Okay. I can never figure out what uh, day it is or time. That's where, it's where it's great to have one of these multi-iPhones or whatever now that tell you exactly what it is where you are because I yeah, can't wait. Yeah, I'm constantly looking at it, and I keep my, my wristwatch on local time to, to try and figure out how I am doing on local time. About 40 years ago, we had a big, uh, literally a spreadsheet, a big big piece of paper because of all the different time zones, and then you bring in daylight saving, oh. et cetera, and it just screws your head in a big way. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, back in those days, I used to have a watch, and I, I just ran uh, Zulu time on it. It was probably that big around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it had to be big. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So <clears throat> Rod Lovell's our guest today, and he's had an interesting career and a really interesting experience he's going to tell us about. Uh, he had to ditch a DC-3 uh, immediately after takeoff. I think it was like 46 seconds. Of flight, right? And uh, he's going to tell us about that in a second. But before we start, I'd like to, if you could, Rod, catch us up on uh, how you got into flying and uh, what was what was your career like? Very interesting career. I think I grew up on a farm just south of Adelaide, and I remember as a kid watching the uh, local superphosphate people uh, in tiger moths and beavers, oh. uh, top of superphosphate in the surrounding hills. And I was fascinated as a, as a toddler by the aeroplanes going over. Um, I never knew anybody in our family or friends that had aviation. So most of it I had to sort of figure out for myself and without the internet, et cetera. And I remember as a kid, we used to go to Adelaide Airport and just watch on the side of the road, the aeroplanes landing and taking off. And it was, it was superb. I then went and joined the Air Force, the Royal Australian Air Force, in uh, 68, and I, I never had the educational qualifications to be a pilot, although I wanted to be. So I joined as a ground crew as an instrument fitter, and whilst I was studying that during the day, I did, uh, what do you call it, uh, correspondence to gain the educational qualifications to become a pilot. And I was very fortunate, three years as ground crew and then uh, transferred or accepted as pilot training in the Air Force. With that, I flew after graduation, I flew Mirages and then transferred onto Orions. And I can tell you why, I... Mirage is a beautiful aeroplane, absolutely um, superb, as they call it, the French lady, She's, she is superb. I was lucky enough to go twice the speed of sound and everything was superb, however, I do not have the Tom Cruise personality of a fighter pilot. I I never went to the bar every night and said, oh, I'm the greatest fighter pilot the JC ever put breath in. So the fighter world and myself came to a mutual uh, understanding and agreement. And from there, I transferred onto P3 Orions. And that was entirely different in a big crude environment and beautiful airplane once again. I spent uh, 10 years in the Air Force and then went civilian flying, uh, what did I get into? Argosies, DC-3s, Learjets, and basically uh, other jets. I had a stint with Qantas as a simulator instructor on 747s. So I actually got a 747 endorsement, but it was in a simulator, not the aeroplane. And that was the time of the... Um, uh, we had a, a pilot's dispute in Australia, what they call it not a strike, but a policy bit. So basically the airlines and the tourist industry shut down. So my term with Qantas was, um, was terminated, terminated just after about uh, eight months, I think. So And then I went back to general aviation again and flew DC-9s. And I've had a, a checkered career. And I will tell you something. When I was flying DC-3s and uh, 
say Argosies and other other corporate jets or whatever. I was always envious. All my mates from the Air Force went to fly with the major airlines and most of them down here flew with Cathay Pacific. And I was always envious. I really was. However, in my twilight years of aviation, I look back now and I am so, so pleased that I had a very, what would you say, very career, very aeroplanes. Sure, I've been not placed. the same old stuff. Yeah. Exactly. It is not boring. It is not it boring. Is. You get a, a DC-3 and you land on a on a clay pan or something like that, or you, you medivac somewhere which nobody's ever been to ever before. So I look back now with a big smile and contentment on my face. So um, as, as Scott said, um, we can go into it in a minute if you want to, in um, 94, which in four days' time will be 29 years oh. since I, uh, I did the DC-3 in the Botany Bay, and uh, I got crucified for it. Oh. Well, just before we get to that, I, I do have a question about flying P th P-3s. So you did the sub-hunter mission with that airplane? Correct. Yeah, and did you do that crazy stuff like the Navy does and shut down one or two engines? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we used to, uh, immediately after takeoff, we'd shut down number one engine, and then uh, probably about three or four hours later, shut down number four, and we'd just cruise around all day with two engines, and our requirement was if we got below a 1,000 feet, then we had to start up on a, another engine. We had to, had to have three engines going if we went below a 1,000 feet. But it was a different mission, I think, to what they do these days with the P-8 Poseidons because they, I think those guys most of the time are up around 20,000, 30,000 feet just watching mm. it off. Whereas we had a ball. See all this coastline here? <laughs> See all of it from 100 feet. I've seen all of Australia's coastline from 100 feet. So I'm happy, chappy. Yeah. Well, you guys dropped uh, radio son or uh, songs into the to listen for subs in the ocean. And then Correct. The Sonner Son Boys uh, are, are dropped, and uh, then the uh, the hydrophone goes down a certain um, depth. It all depends on the temperature of the water, and, and that's, a, that's a science which I never got into up the pointy end. I just did what I was told. But, um, no, it was, it was very interesting. The other thing, too, Scott, uh, which you may be aware of, when I was flying the P3 Orions in the mid-'70s, it's only recently that I've, found out or been aware that the Cold War was not that really cold. It really wasn't over here. Uh, we were we were just told by our Intellos, who we used to call the spies, uh, the Intellos would come in and brief us and just say, go to Diego Garcia or, or go here or go there and just report on what you see. But it's now we're finding out that, uh, as I said, the Cold War wasn't that cold at times. It was very close. It was in a lot of different places, particularly around Korea. Uh, Correct. That part of the world, the yeah, Korea adventures and uh, intercepts in Alaska, which I understand have been picking up lately. Uh, the Russians, in particular, uh, are uh, intercepting different airplanes and stuff. Did you also yes. in the P three drop uh, any sub torpedoes? Uh, we practice. We practice every now and then uh, for the torpedoes. We also done, did interesting things, um, dropping torpedoes to Macquarie Island. If you know Macquarie Island is halfway between Australia and Antarctica, and we have a permanent base there, uh, Australia, and so we dropped torpedoes of um, magazines and fresh fruit and things like that. And that was interesting because we had, I think the um, the little peninsula that we had to drop on was uh only a couple hundred meters wide and then all surrounding is all the bull seals and things like that and if you miss the peninsula the guys would say no we're not going in there with all the bull seals no way in the world but but with uh, as you know military constraints we never had a chance to practice so it was live drops first off yeah interesting oh, well it's good time yeah, that's uh, that's interesting stuff. So tell us about your uh, DC three incident in Botany Bay. It can't it's take very me long. It's only a short flight. It's only forty six <laughs> seconds. Yeah, I, I don't even know whether I logged it one. <laughs> there, was, there was there was a landing, right? That's right. Unapproved though, because I didn't have a float plane endorsement, so they wouldn't give me one afterwards. But anyway, seriously. We 
taxied out of uh, Sydney Airport. All procedures were normal, all the checklists, everything like that. Everything there was no indication of anything wrong whatsoever. What was um, the nature of the flight? Was it a um, passenger or cargo or? Correct. It was a, it was a passenger flight out to Norfolk Island, um, and the the we had on board the Scots College school band who were going out for an Anzac Day service on the 25th. So this happened on the 24th of April. And we had uh, a total of 25 POB. The interesting thing is, I wasn't aware of that until day, two days after the accident. There was a passenger put on that I wasn't aware of. I did all my trim sheet, et cetera, on 24 POB. And there is um, news recordings of me saying, no, there was only 24, there wasn't 25. Anyway. We taxied out, did the engine checks, et cetera, applied power, and everything appeared normal. Everything, there was no misfiring. There was nothing whatsoever. Rotated. Should I say the co-pilot in the right-hand seat was doing the takeoff because they've got to get experience, obviously. Um, the interesting thing is the co-pilot and his father owned the aeroplane and did the maintenance on the aeroplane. That plays a big part in it later. So the co-pilot did the takeoff, and uh, at about 200 feet, the left engine gave a couple of bangs and, and it sort of veered just slightly left, that's all. And with that, the co-pilot who was flying called engine failure left engine. I confirmed that, as we do, you know, look at the, the gauges, the feel of the aeroplane, everything like that, and... Uh, he, he commanded the shutdown, which which we did, which would push the feather button, throttle feather mixture, all that sort of stuff. And that was all done in accordance with the operations manual um, emergency procedures. And as you know, one, and, and I guess, Scott, you know too, um, before takeoff, you give an emergency briefing. What you're going to do if you have a, an emergency failure, an uh, engine failure or, or something, other major emergency. Our briefing was... We were taking off on one six, and and at that time one six was a single runway. It wasn't the the twin runway that it is today. So we we briefed that we would return on uh, the east west runway and and land there as normal procedures as as most people give. So we'd shut down the engine, the left engine. The interesting thing is that the tower guy was very observant, and uh, he said. Uh, and can then Charlie confirm operations normal? And I said, uh, uh, negative, we've just had a slight problem and we'll be uh, uh, returning shortly as per the briefing. We shut down the engine, did the phase one items, phase two items, and realised the aeroplane was not accelerating, it wasn't climbing, it wasn't doing anything except slowing down. And so at that stage, I took over control of the aeroplane, sent taking over, and the co-pilot relinquished control. So at 200 feet, just after takeoff, <laughs> DC-3, which is really not a high performance, you've got to think real quick. So my options were, or as I saw it at the time, my options were three options. Land back on the runway that I'd just taken off from. One six, as you know, is fairly long at Sydney. But... I wasn't sure whether the landing gear was up or down or wherever. In, in the DC-3, you select it up and you hope the gear came up, but it's totally independent. You'll often see photos of a DC-3 with one gear up and one down, etc. And so if I landed back on the runway, I was totally uncertain as to where the gear was, and I thought that's, that's not nice. Coupled with the fact that we probably would have slid off the end of the runway and the end of the runway at Sydney Airport... They've got these beautiful rocks that are about a metre cubed with incredibly sharp corners. And I thought, if I slid off there, that's going to slice the fuel tanks open and we'd all be burnt to death, nothing sure of. So option one was out. Option two was to divert to the left and go to the, try and make the new runway, uh, which, as I said, wasn't a cleared runway. There were mounds of earth, there were machinery, there was lots of things, plus... I didn't have the performance to go across the side to side slip to the side step to the side. So being an old P3 driver who'd been taught to ditch aeroplanes, I thought, I'll ditch this, not a problem at all. All I had to do, I knew the, um, the configuration, I knew the approach. All I had to do was insert DC3 speeds for Orion speeds. So that was easy. So 
that was didn't, even have any, didn't even have any swells to try to figure out, right? No. Oh, look, I, I can tell you, we, um, anyway, we, I, I retired the power. I was waiting for um, ground effect to come in, and it didn't. Whether we were in it the whole time, and I thought, this is going to help me, and it didn't. So within literally seconds, I just called for full flap and ditched the aeroplane. The aeroplane swung around to the right, about 90 degrees. Um, that was done because the right engine was still, the propeller was still going. So as it hit the water, the aeroplane swung around to the right and the right engine was ripped out. Um, I expected to see carnage down the back. I really did. Turned around and all these kids are standing up and they're very disciplined and they were putting on their life jackets. There was no screaming. There was nothing like a certain um, television program that show the passengers <laughs> all going berserk. I was incredibly proud of the way they did it. They conducted it well. There's another couple of side steps like that, but we did um, we did the same. We shut down the uh, the cockpit, as in the fuel and electrics, etc., trying to minimise any any further um, damage or or what would you call it um, risk danger risk. To, to the passengers. Yeah, and then when we'd done all that and the the passengers were then evacuating, there was about four or five pleasure boats that are out there fishing on a Sunday morning. And uh, when I was, when the passengers had got out, uh, I and the supernumerary pilot, not the co-pilot, the supernumerary pilot, um, went through the aeroplane, almost the same as you see Sully in the movie, uh, went checking, make sure there were no passengers sort of that had been under the seats or in cargo compartments or whatever. And when we were safe, we, we um, evacuated the aeroplane. But... Uh, yeah, it was it was very interesting. The other thing too, which I'd like to mention, you're sitting in a boat you, uh, that's that's uh, evacuated, you rescued you, and you're looking at an aeroplane sitting in the water, and the the doubt, the doubt that hits you is incredible. Um, I can't express how much I consider myself a professional pilot, an experienced pilot. And there's an aeroplane that I'm in command of sitting in the water. What did I do wrong? The self-doubt, and it never really leaves you for weeks and weeks because of the, the system, as in the departments, won't tell you what they found out. So the self-doubt is incredible. Um, then comes in the alone uh, symptoms, I guess. I wasn't part of a union. I wasn't part of a federation. I've got nobody to talk to about it, and uh, it's it's very. What I'm saying is, the, the ditching was the easy part. I do it again today. It really was, but the the effects after the ditching, the self doubt, the alone. Who can you talk to? You know, you're. I'm the captain. I'm I'm responsible. There are planes sitting in the water. You know, what did I do wrong? And uh, there's nobody to sort of even talk to about it. So that was a bit. Uh, debilitating um but anyway we went to the shore but it, but a key point is is that everybody survived there were no the, the, significant injuries at all the, the flight attendant broke one of her wrists and there was a reason for that um uh, which which i won't go into now but yeah that was the only physical injury a, a broken wrist so i was I was very proud when we went to the uh, the hospitals. We all went to different hospitals, obviously, and um, learned that everybody survived it. It was great. So. That's huge. Yeah. So the uh, the reaction to in the investigation was uh, <coughs> not enthusiastic. No, it was a good old it was a good old fashioned uh, pilot error. Um, one of the reasons that I saw for this, and I could be wrong, was we had a, a problem in Australia with, uh, I happened in the middle of two other significant fatal accidents. There was a Navajo crash into the hills at um, Young and killed about nine people. There was an aeroplane, uh, Aero Commander, I think it was, that was going from Sydney to Lord Howe Island, and he crashed into the sea going and again killed nine or 11 people. So the department had to be seen 
to be doing something to save face. And uh, and they admit that. They admit they had to be get the public confidence back again. So pick on Ron. It's, it's, it's quite easy. If he doesn't have a union, he doesn't have anybody to back him up, he's not going to take the department to court because he doesn't have the money. So... So you just go along and, and um, as I said, 29 years later, I'm still fighting and, and I'll get there. But I just, um, the interesting thing with the aeroplane, I said to them after the uh, after the accident, immediately after the accident, I said, Jato Pods would not have kept that old girl in the air. There's no way in the world Jato Pods would have. And um, that's for your listeners, uh, Jet Assistant take off. And that's how much the right engine was not producing the power. They would not accept that whatsoever. Not at all. It was, they, they said I was overloaded. They said I didn't know how to fly a DC-3, even though they had approved me as a check and training captain on DC-3s, etc. So I think that they just had preconceived ideas and they they wanted the conditions or, or the circumstances, the facts, to fit their conditions and not listen to the truth. If we can fast forward to um, 2018, I was invited across to the Netherlands um, to fly a DC-3 flight simulator that had just been certified under the ESA uh, conditions over there. I didn't think anybody in the world would have a DC-3 flight simulator. There was a gentleman over there who had built one and it was certified. So in the simulator, we put in all the alleged conditions, the overweight conditions, everything that the, the Bureau of Air Safety Investigation had said. And at 200 feet, the computer program, the left engine failure, and you'll never guess what happened in the simulator. Left engine failed, 200 feet, and we kept climbing. We kept climbing. And in the right-hand seat was the Dutch Dakota Association and also a KLM check and training captain. He was DC-3 and also 777 and I think 787 rated. So he's in the right-hand seat. And I said to Tom, I said, this is nothing like my aeroplane, nothing at all. And uh, with that, we, we thought, well, let's experiment to see if I can replicate my scent into Botany Bay. As, as you guys know, the 1830, Pratt and Whitney 1830, should produce 1,200 horsepower on takeoff. So at 200 feet, about the third or fourth um, attempt, by reducing the right-hand power back to about 800 horsepower, that's when I could replicate my descent into Botany Bay. And I said, that that proves exactly what I was saying. The right-hand engine was down on power. Now, the interesting thing is, if I can, can I show a couple of things, Scott? Sure. <clears throat> sure. Righto. No, that's not showing that, is it? You have a, you have a picture of it? <clears throat> if you have a picture, uh, I can share the screen. Yeah. Or, anyway, or in, it, in the report. Take a, picture the, of it and take a picture of it and send it to me. And when I yeah. post it, I can put it on the screen. Yeah, yeah. we'll do so in the official report, the Bureau of Air Safety report, it says that the right-hand engine has no, had no pre-existing abnormalities. On page 14, it says that. However, in documents I got out of the Bureau of Air Safety about um, a year or two after, they found, and, and listen to this, this is something I cannot absolutely believe, that after they cleaned and recapped the spark plugs, they then tested them, and the right-hand engine, which should have kept us in the air, 11 of the 28 spark plugs were unserviceable. After the clean rig at them, how many were unserviceable before they went that? And yet in the official report, it says there were no pre-existing abnormalities in the right-hand engine. So that's they're little things like that that I'm fighting all the time. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Those are huge. I uh, And plus the age of the airplane, the age of the engine, these engines were actually on extensions to uh, TBO. <clears throat> they, were, they were, they should have been overhauled at a thousand hours. Um, it's my understanding that both engines were on extension, but not approved. The department had moved those extensions. 
And, and as most people, I think it's the uh, census in, in the industry, if you extend the life of one engine, the other engine should be about the third and a half life is, is sort of the, the normality. And not here's two same. engines. Yeah, not the same. Both engines. Of them, both of them were over a thousand hours. What configuration, did you determine the configuration of the landing gear after the crash? Yeah, it was up. They said it was up. Okay, up so yeah, flaps down and gear up. Yeah. Yes, in fact, again, the flaps traveling, um, they're in the traveling position. They hadn't extended to full flaps when when I ditched, but they were within a, two, a degree or two of optimum lift positions where we actually uh, ditched. So uh, everything came good. That's good. And what uh, <clears throat> equivalent FAR part here in the States would this have been operated under? Was it like a charter flight? or It wasn't a regularly scheduled flight. It was... No, charter. Charter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 24, 25 souls on board, kids, uh, and fuel, you didn't have enough on that airplane to be overloaded at all. Well, no, they, they've concocted everything. They, they really have. We had the fuel. We were going to go through uh, Lord Howe to refuel. Lord Howe Island is halfway between Sydney and uh, Norfolk. But, um, no, they alleged that everything was, was over. But listen to this, you guys. Um Guess how they weighed the they they dragged the old girl out about two days later at, at night time, and they weighed all the passenger baggage. And as I'm sitting here, they weighed them on an old analog set of bathroom scales, and the water is still dripping out oh. of the bags. Oh. And I said to the Bureau of Air Safety guy, I said, "It's not really right that the water is dripping out." I said, "You can't do that." And he said, oh, yes, we factor it. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. I've, got, I, I have, I've had two, I think, two engine issues in twins that, uh, that I think relate to this. Is Actually, I was flying a DC-3, <clears throat> and we were doing a practice engine out and uh, approach. And I think about, we did, we're going missed approach. And then the, the right seater was supposed to just get the engine running again. Instead, he shut it off. <clears throat> and this is a, a Super 3 I was flying. It had 1820s on it. So that's actually 1,425 horsepower compared to 1,200 yes. in the 1830. And with that engine, um, <clears throat> with that engine off, uh, I, could not, uh, I could not climb more than a couple of hundred feet. And, you know, just maintaining zero side slip was a, a handful. Yes, so, yeah. The, the interesting thing is um, that out of, out of this, in all the investigation, nobody wanted to listen to my thoughts. You know, I was, I was a captain. I was reasonably experienced on DC-3s. I think I had just under 1,000 hours on DC-3s. And they just did not want to listen to a word I said about anything. The um, the, the other thing, too, it was a 40-year-old aeroplane. The parasitic drag was... <laughs> was absolutely incredible. It had a huge bulbous window out the right hand side. But even so the walkway, as you know, up on the on the wings to the engine where you put the oil in, etc., that was all flaky. It was all coming coming out. The ailerons, which um I can't think of the, the length of them now, the 18 feet or something, the, the ailerons, um, they were misrigged so much, so much that the left hand fixed tab had been replaced by one at least twice as normal size. That's how much they were misrigged. Yeah. And and when when you're flying normally with two engines, you you don't know this or you don't pick it up. Um, but no, those 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 engines were way down on power. And the other thing too, people say, well, Rod, why didn't you why didn't you pick this up? There were no indications in the run ups or anything like that at all. Yeah, that and, was my question, Scott. If you can run us through a proper power check, how do you or or uh, rock. it's more than just a magneto check that you're doing on the power check and, and how does that go again well the thing is and pratt and whitney admit this that there is no point really doing a power check on anything with a constant speed prop because all the, the prop does is, is fine off to give you the rpm the only way and i have not seen this done in 50 years in australia the only way to test the power on a constant speed prop engine is to put a club on it, a TCP, test club prop, the, the wooden prop with a fixed pitch. And I have not seen that in years. So 
these engines were old, they were worn out. But I think what's significant, I think my personal belief is, and I can't prove it, I think the, the left engine, the one that failed, was a far better engine and produced more power. And I think that was masking the right-hand engine being down on performance. And when we lost the left engine, which I think was a better engine, more powerful engine, that's that's what it all turned to worms. If we lost the right one instead of the left one, there's probably a chance that we would have made it. Yeah. Mm. So I, I think an, a significant factor is also the spark plugs because, and that's probably the reason why, one of the big reasons why it was down on power, besides being old and loose and, uh, you know, the especially old airplanes, they're not going to make book numbers anymore. No. They're just not. No. So and, I had a, I had, I don't know if you've seen the video that I did about a B-25 with an engine failure in Las Vegas. The reason I had that engine failure is because the guy who owned it, uh, owned the airplane, had uh, bought a large tranche, you know, several boxes of new old stock spark plugs from World War II, which are only supposed to do 25 hours, and then you change them, you throw them out. And we were on like, I think 75 hours. I didn't know this at the time. We were on 75 hours and that engine started backfiring and eating itself alive. And I ended up having to shut it down. And yeah. because of old spark plugs. Well, the interesting thing, exactly what you're saying. This airplane was signed out of a hundred hourly about, I think they said four hours before. Um, and they also said, there was no evidence that the spark plugs had been taken out and cleaned or anything. So the maintenance, I've, I've since found out in the last year under our freedom of information here, um, the maintenance was non-existent. And as I said, the owners, the co-pilot and his father owned the airplane. They did the maintenance and um, allegedly under the freedom of information, it was in the wrong category. It should have been the transport category. And in fact, it was in like the general aviation category. For three years, the Civil Aviation Authority knew about this and didn't do anything. Apparently, the uh, the owners who did the maintenance were not approved to do maintenance on a DC-3. And the Civil Aviation Authority knew about this for three years and did nothing about it. And when it ends up with a drink, it's my fault. <laughs> the maintenance was... What caused, and people say to me, what caused the um, the engine failure in the first place? Well, in, in terms, we have rocker arms that push the uh, uh, the valve stem down, right, or the valve to open. Each side of the rocker arm, there should be washer on the, on the whatever you call it, the pinion that goes through the rocker arm. One of those washers was never, ever fitted correctly. And that went down the valve stem tube, right? The uh, the valve tube, and it had been so long it had rubbed the valve, the intake valve stem, for quite a while, and and it had deformed. It had gone through the valve stem ten percent or something like that, and then it had it had gone instead of the flat shape, it had gone that way. And on my takeoff, that was enough for that uh, washer to drop down and block the intake valve. And so the intake valve was stopped from closing. And so every time the uh, the cylinder sucked in air, that the air was already burned. That's what caused the first, first one. Interesting. So, Interesting. so that, that intake valve being open like that then affected everything else on that, that row. Correct. Correct. Every time the uh, cylinder sucked in air, it was already already burnt. Eighteen thirty is zero radial one. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Okay, so we're not so we're not talking about a single cylinder failure. You're talking about a whole bank of cylinders. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. And yeah. uh, oh, look, I I guess the biggest thing is I'm extremely disappointed in the way our departments. Uh, Civil Aviation Authority and the Bureau of Air Safety Investigation conducted the... There wasn't an investigation at all. There's none whatsoever. The the maintenance people have never been brought to answer for anything what they, they did. And the other thing too, do you remember that report that I held up, Scott? And I'll, I'll send you later on. 
Um, the whole idea of a report, accident report, would be the same in the States, where all signatories, all countries are signatories to ICAO. And under Annex 13, each country is required to put out a report so that the same thing doesn't happen again. Right? That's the whole idea of it. That report, which I showed you, is words fail me on to how it, how it was ever published. The sad thing is, two years after my accident, uh, the Dutch Dakota Association, PHDDA, uh, DC3, in the Netherlands, crashed in incredibly similar circumstances. I think it was in uh, September 96, killed 32 people. Oh my. They had a left engine failure. They had a propeller that wouldn't feather. It, it cycled in and out of feathering. And, and yours, oh, by the way, by the way, before you continue, yours did not go all the way to full feather. It stuck to correct. the way. Correct. But I, I didn't have time to see that. When I was oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, shutting sure. down the, the engine, um, I looked out there, I saw that the propeller had stopped, and that then I concentrated back on the, the flying. But it's um yeah, so so incredibly similar circumstances to the DDA one in the Netherlands that uh, tragically killed 32 people. He he got below VMCA and, and went in. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's not good. What was the condition of the left prop on? Was it in the full feathered position or did it just stop rotating and was still um, not? They, they, they set it uh, about 66 degrees. Instead of 88, it should have gone, <clears throat> excuse okay. me, full feather to 88 degrees. It was about 66. And they said, <laughs> the system said, that is insignificant drag. And all the, the people that I've uh, talked to throughout the industry and um, aerodynamic people said it would produce significant drag. But it was no longer windmilling. It, it was enough to stop the prop, yes. the prop from rotating. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, um, no, it was, uh, as I said, there's a lot of thing in 46 seconds, and you guys will, uh, it's, it's all coming in now to um, accident investigations. Startle factor. Yeah. You know, if, if you put in, and I've, I've got to admit, we weren't startled because we, we had pre briefed this, and I guess I wouldn't say, well, yes, we do. I do. I'm a pessimist. I'm a, I'm a pessimist and I'm going to have an engine failure on takeoff and I've done that all my life. And therefore, my brain is all set up and I know what I'm going to do. So that um, on that particular day, no, we didn't have a, a startle factor at all. We just straight into it, left engine failure, close it down, do the checklist. And uh, But, but I the didn't fact that you wouldn't remain airborne had to be rather startling or unnerving. I mean, you're just watching a performance decay right up from underneath you. True. I, I can tell you another another story which influenced me enormously. Um, in 1980, a Super King Air took off on the East West Runway of Sydney. Its registration was uh, Victor Hotel Alpha Alpha Victor, I think it was. And the guy in a King Air had a left left engine, failure and he tried to make it back. He turned around and tried to make it back. Tragically. He slammed into the seawall and killed 13 people, including a one week old baby. Now, I landed at Sydney Airport in 1980, about half an hour after that. And and you can imagine all the emergency vehicles are there, uh, the smoke, there's everything. And you know, there's been a tragic, horrific accident on the airport. So, when this happened to me uh, in 94, actually happened to me in engine failure. I can remember that because that happened just down there. I can remember exactly where it was. And the feeling, the presence, I don't I don't know the, the words to use. Uh, don't let that happen to your passengers, whatever you do. That was my overwhelming fear. Do not let that happen to your passengers. Sacrifice the airplane, do whatever you have to do, but don't let it happen to your passengers. So whether that's a guiding presence, I, I don't know, but... Uh, yeah, we, we converted it. So I, I, I was happy, very happy that yeah. to, to turn around, as I said, and see all these kids standing up. What I'm So what, what I'm, were all the ramifications after this um, investigation, uh, well, to your career and to your ratings and all that? 
there endeth my career. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. Was it. Yep. What happened was they the system asked me to undertake counselling. Now, counselling in their form was I've done something wrong and they're going to tell me what I've done wrong. It was nothing to do with, oh, you feel you've felt alone and helpless and all that. Nothing to do with that touchy-feely stuff. It was, oh, you've stuffed up, Rod, and we're going to tell you what you did wrong. So I refused to do counselling because I knew I didn't do a damn thing wrong and 29 years later I'll still stand by those those remarks. Um, so I refused to do it. So for nine weeks, the department uh, bullied me, intimidated me, harassed me, and they eventually said, if you don't attend counselling, we'll suspend your licence. And I said, well, I'm not attending counselling. So they nine weeks after the accident, but this is the interesting thing. They suspended one of my licences and one of my endorsements. So I, I had... Um, I. I think it was my airline transport license, they suspended, and my DC3 rating. So with my commercial license, I could still go and fly a 747 with 400 people on board. <laughs> but they said, no, no, you're a danger to the safety air navigation. So if I'm a safety, you take, if I'm going to breach safety standards, you either suspend my license that day or within probably 24 hours is a normal reason, normal time, if I'm a real danger. It's, it's, it's ludicrous what they did. Absolutely ludicrous. Yeah, it sounds like a witch hunt. But <laughs> what I'm really interested in is is that that decision making. That okay, we've done everything according to the checklist. We got the uh, the single engine things set up here. The co-pilot's still flying, and uh, he's 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 got his controls in, and we're not we're not climbing. We're not accelerating. So to me, it's like, okay, yeah, the engine failed and the other engine didn't produce power. Um, you know, all that's well and good. That presents the situation that you're in. But what I find fascinating is that you read the energy state of the airplane and that's, we, we don't have it. We don't have enough to do anything basically except uh, land nearly straight ahead in the water. Exactly. I. Um... One of the things I'm pleased about is is uh, my uh, prioritising of, of the situation. And when it, when it wasn't accelerating and not climbing, I said to Nick, taking over, I took over. I didn't want to get near BMCA. I, no way in the world. And uh, so there's only one way to do it is put the nose down. You've got to put the nose down, keep the speed up. And I was, I was very happy. With that too, um, I ditched the aeroplane, the speed was coming back through 65 knots and I was very happy because I'm fully aware of this. Uh, Any time you have impact, whether it's in a car or a plane or a boat or whatever, it's all about the the energy management. E equals MC squared. So the, the slower you can impact something, the the uh, the greater the chance of survivability. So I knew the stall speed of the aeroplane. So as I was coming back through 65 knots, uh, that's when I, I touched down and, and that was good. I never lost... Never lost control at all because I, I know if you lose control of the aeroplane, you, you sign the, the death certificates of everybody on board. So, um, yeah, it, it took. <laughs> I remember when we got home that night, my uh, I said to my, my then wife, I said, I'm absolutely amazed. My brain went like a computer and she burst out laughing. And she said, Rod, that would never ever happen. So, <laughs> but it's amazing how you, you, uh, okay. sit through. All the information that you've learned over 10, 20, 30 years of flying, and you say, that's what I've got to do. There was no time to panic, no time to do anything. Just you've got a job to do, and you do it. Yep. You focus on what, what's required. You know, yes. it's not a, and it's not a wishful thinking situation. Well, I'd rather, <laughs> like the King Air guy, I'd rather go back to the runway because that's my happy place. Yes, and yes. I don't have the energy. And yeah. And you have to get over that, don't don't you? That's that's a, a, a bit of self discipline. You you have to like as I said, the the new runway, I wouldn't say it was beckoning me, but I was aware that it was there and I looked and no, it's too far away, I can't make it. Whereas as as you say, it's uh it's a happy place and, and you have to sort of push that aside and become very disciplined in carrying out what you know is the correct procedures to do. They <laughs> 
the system, the system said to me, one of the people said, oh, Rod, you should have continued straight ahead and across the other side of um, Botany Bay was Canal Oil Refinery. That'd be great, wouldn't it? You know, if I'm at 20 feet, you know, they, they've got no idea. They've got no idea at all. And they have, whatever, two or three years to come up with this scenario of what they think I should have done. And I had 46 seconds and not a lot of time. Yeah, not a lot of time. You don't have many choices. And uh, as decaying airspeed and altitude, there's just not much to give up there. Yeah. No, there's not. And, you've, you've, and it's, it's an amazing, I guess, feeling uh, even reflecting back on it now to push an aeroplane into the water, and you've never done a water landing before, to push an aeroplane in and you don't know what's going to happen. You really don't know. There were there were newspaper reports, as the media can always do, uh, with two senior journalists on board who said, when we hit the water, it dove under the water and actually bounced off the bottom. <laughs> uh, we're, it's true, it's true, it's on the internet. And we bounced off the bottom and then came back up. Now, I think what happened was as we as as we touched down, as the nose came down, there was a bow wave that just came up and then flowed down over the side windows. That's all they saw water running down the side windows. There's no way in the world the nose went anywhere near. But uh, the media is good sometimes. Yeah. It's amazing. So but, what, um, wow. What kind of flying you've been doing here lately? Well. It's interesting. Um, I'm freely admit that for 25 years I was in a very, very dark place. I had nowhere to go, nowhere to turn to. I hated aeroplanes. I hated aviators. I hated pilots. I had anything to do with aviation because of the way I've been treated. Um, and so for 25 years, it was no good at all. And then, then I wrote my book. And which I'll give you uh, a photo of later on, um, wrote my book. And that has been, to say it's been life-changing, it's been absolutely incredible. I thought it would be a way of telling a few few people I self-published because I wanted all my words to be my words. I didn't want it to go to the big publishers where they fluff it up and make it a Mills and Boone and things like that. So that is all my words. And my aim was to sell 200 books. Well, now it's uh, coming up on three and a half years since it was released. I've sold well over 2,000 books. Cool. And I, yeah, I'm very, very pleased. And I give talks at local clubs and organisations. And uh, it's it's superb. So what that has done has changed my whole belief. People now want to know the story. Instead of being a, a shag on a rock for 25 years in a dark place, People now want to know the story, the real story, and they're supporting me, which is absolutely superb. So with that support, as I say to the, my, my uh, audience, et cetera, that em empowers me. I've, I've come back. So mm -hmm. a long story short, uh, I got my licence back about three years ago, my medical, all that. Um, and a year ago, I bought a little Beechcraft Musketeer. So uh -huh. I'm on I'm on cloud nine now. I really, Good. I'm, I'm, I'm back to a place that I never, ever thought I would even envisage again. So, no, I, I flew that a couple of days ago. I want to fly it every week if I can. So it's, well, it's good. Great. I'm glad to hear it's, you're back in the air. It's wow. a nice feeling. Yeah, it's a nice long, feeling. It's a long time off, man. Well, it is. And I, I never, ever thought I'd come back one. Um, yeah. I, I thought the whole world was against me. And as I said, that's that's changed a little bit now. It's only the authorities that are against me still. <laughs> but the, the general public are in awe. When I, when I give talks about my experience, et cetera, um, they're just blown away. They said, Rod, this shouldn't happen. This shouldn't happen in these days. Um, so it's, it's it's very interesting times. But it's, I'm back in a happy place now, and that's important. It really is. and. I guess for anybody who's been through trauma, I don't think I've been through trauma. I've, I've had a bad fight for a while, but there's a lot of people worse off than me, that's for sure. Mm. Uh, 
Good well, stuff. Good job working through it. <laughs> that's a long time. That's a long, long time. time. I didn't know that uh, you were out, uh, out of flying for that long. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I just, I just had no wish to, to have anything to do with airplanes. People would offer to take me flying. I said, no, it's gone. The passion's gone now. I class myself as a passionate aviator. You know, I, I bought a Tiger Moth. Uh, I did a whole lot of things. I bought a Beach 18. I, I went around Australia. I did a whole lot of things. And I class myself as a passionate aviator. And when they took a license off me, that gutted me. That really ripped my guts out. And I, I could not believe you saved the lives of 25 people and that's how they thank you. I just, it, it just blows my mind. Yeah. So, uh, and I appreciate people like yourselves who who um, want to listen to my story. It, it means a lot to me. Yeah, um, I'm Good glad story. we finally were able to put it on the air. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, one thing I, I will say, getting back to the accident, if, if we've got time, Scott, or you can cut it out later. Um, people say to me, "Were we lucky?" And I think you you mentioned it. Um, we were damn lucky that day. We really were. Um, we had what we call wing commander's weather, or I guess you guys would call it colonel's weather or something. Um, yeah, great. Weather. Yeah, great weather. Yeah. Yeah, it, was, it was wing commander's weather. It couldn't have been better. It, there was probably a light southerly breeze on those three knots or something like that. The water conditions in Botany Bay, there was probably about three to four inch ripple there. That's, that's about all. But imagine if we'd taken off to the north towards Sydney. Yeah. Township. That's higher terrain right away out of there. You got all that. So um, we we were incredibly lucky. We had small boats there. What would happen if um, if this had happened out at Lord Howe Island or Norfolk Island or halfway in between? Yeah. So we were damn lucky, and I, I acknowledge that. We really were. Had everything going for us. Yeah. That's great. Great story. So. And I'm still fighting. I'm still fighting the system. Yeah. Well, keep tilting. Hope, <laughs> hope you make some headway. Yes. Well, cool. Uh, so, Juan, catch us up on your project, your RV-12 project you're building with kids. Well, we've got the wings finished. They're setting up over there. We just started on the fuselage. So it took us, uh, well, it's April now. So... Just a couple months or so to finish up the bits of the tail that weren't done and then the, the complete set of wings and flaperons. That's Real easy, excellent uh, kit. It's a it's a excellent engineering and uh, plans and it's a it goes together quite easily. And and uh, the the older kids are the better ones to get going on it. Uh, the the high school age kids, we've got a couple of them uh, of homeschool kids that have been really good at uh, uh, doing the work on the airplane and they can <laughs> they're good at it now they can really knock it out quick that's cool so what are you going to do with it when you get done well i don't know we'll either sell it sell the airframe or finish the airframe I, ultimately i think it'd be a cool thing to you know finish as an experimental lsa aircraft and then uh keep it around to have kids learn to fly or you know expose them to flying and and uh um kind of keep it hanging around as a trainer airplane. Yeah, that's cool. They, uh, there's a outfit in uh, Granbury High School, which is just southwest of Fort Worth. Um, they do, uh, they build like, like every year or two, they're building, a, a, it takes maybe two years to build an airplane, but they build an airplane. Kids from high school come in and they spend uh, a, you know, a period or two and they're, they, I think they're on, hesitate to say they're on like number eight mm -hmm. airplane yeah. yeah yeah and they've been yeah. doing rv12s and i think they're doing something else right now mm -hmm. but i think that's tremendous yeah good exposure for the kids and get them doing something besides goofing around on the computers all the time like yeah, us yeah. <laughs> reading their the, um, the rv is becoming very popular down under here and yep. uh, the whole lsa movement is mm -hmm. is superb everywhere. It really is. It's um it's giving a lot of people opportunities now to go flying where they couldn't either afford it or didn't have the medicals or or whatever before. So I'm a um a big big proponent of the uh, the LSA movement here. I, I yeah. So those guys yeah. are genuine. They really are. So. Yep. 
Yeah, get the basic Madden. If anything happens, we'll have something to fly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have basic yes. Madden in Australia? Sorry? You have basic Madden in Australia? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not too bad. Can I ask you guys a question? What sure. What do you think of these um, these Cirrus, what do they call them, caps or something? Oh, the, um, the parachute? Parachute yeah. system? Yeah. Well, I, don't, I think <laughs> I'd be very had reluctant. You a technical term for this, and I now neither of us can remember what it was, but that when you've got equipment that gives you a boost of confidence to allow you to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. Yeah. 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 yeah I don't know. I, I, I don't remember. I'm afraid of a yeah, big, I um, since I, since I, I uh, said that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, the, a, uh, uh, people take higher risks uh, flying Cirruses. They uh, yeah. generally fly into thunderstorms. I was had, talking to a friend the other day who, hey, yeah, this friend of mine came to visit. And, okay, how, yeah, that was really kind of a lot of thunderstorms that day. Oh, yeah, he just picked his way through it. It's like, oh, man, you know, I, would, I wouldn't even fly. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think the airlines were flying. Because it was passing right through DFW, you know, and mm. you know, argue with a thunderstorm. So yeah, it, it it creates a situation where people take more risk than they should have. It, it's a, actually an interesting safety thing, you know, that uh, when you start a safety program, a safety initiative, it actually has uh, a large impact at the very beginning, but then after a while people become used to this new safety thing and then they get more, they start doing things, more risky behavior in another area. Yeah. And uh, Friend, I believe in uh, Bob Hooper's statement. I really do. And that is fly the aircraft to the scene of the accident, just fly it all the way in. And uh, yeah. he didn't, he didn't go on and say, but it's something I'm very aware of. And I mentioned it before, if you can keep that impact speed down. And in fact, with my musketeer, I self-brief on takeoff what I'm going to do if I have an engine failure. And I say to myself, and my impact speed will be 55 knots so that I know that to come back to that, just don't try and put it in the paddock, but try and get back to that speed and uh, to a, um, a more survivable impact speed. Yeah. Yep. But to finish off about the caps, the parachute, the BRS, the ballistic recovery system, I think it's a good idea. But a lot of people think that uh, they could you could put them on airplanes like my Bonanza, and there's no way. Mm. You know, the airplane's not designed to take those kind of stresses. And basically, the if you use the caps in a series, it's done. Yeah, the yeah. frame's totaled. Yeah. We we also had an interesting one at Bankstown Airport about a month or six weeks ago, where a Cirrus, I don't know the reason, but it it ended up upside down on the on the runway. And the fireys wouldn't go near it because they didn't know how to disarm the caps. Mm -hmm. And here's a guy, he's been in an aircraft accident. He was, I think, seriously injured, an older guy. But they, and rightfully so, they didn't want to go near it because they didn't know how to disarm it. Mm. That, that's another feature that has to come in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then a way of cutting the thing away <laughs> after you've done your your parachute landing we've had one <laughs> that everybody got out just fine but then the aircraft the wind picked up and the aircraft just dragged for miles and miles <laughs> yeah i i could see this some of the time being like the old coyote on the road runner <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah yeah i think mike patey actually put a brs system in his uh, scrappy mm. Yeah. Did you? you didn't see now, see, now with these big bush planes, the wings are the parachute. I mean, geez, <laughs> you, don't, you don't need one on a, on a slow plane. Yeah. Well, he's got a he's got one. Had a great video huh. where he did a, a test. You know, he actually maybe shot, he shot the rocket. I think the wings are going to come off the thing or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, he, he was being ulti ultimately safe. Uh, so. No, well, that's a neat design. It's. A, He's an incredible, he is the modern day Howard Hughes, is what I call uh, Petey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, they're both pretty interesting people. They just yeah. innovate and uh, all kinds of stuff all the time. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I think that was uh, a pretty good talk about uh, 
uh, ditching and uh, um... there's one one thing I'll just add if I can. You might want to keep it in or, or not. Um, I put on P Prune. Do you know you guys know P Prune Forum? Yeah. And yeah, I good. put yep. yeah, and I put on there, and I said to you, do you guys, you airline guys, are you taught to ditch an aeroplane? Because remember now we've gone done away with four engine aeroplanes. We're down to two engines now. Going a long no, way. It's, it's just a mentioned in the in the guide, yeah. and it's the same old guidance we've been reading yeah. ever since we learned to fly, and uh, nothing's really changed on it. And on uh, my engine failure, well, an hour and a half out, we're sitting there on one engine for a long time, coming between an hour and a half out from Los Angeles over the Pacific. We were coming in from Hawaii, and yeah. The fog's down there. It's three in the morning, and you think, "Ah, oh, damn!" It's a terrible the, situation. The chances of ditching this successfully are not yeah. very good. But I asked these guys. I said, "Are you taught to ditch?" And you know what they all came back with? They said, "Oh, it's, ditching is just like landing." And I said, "Mate, it is nothing like the configuration, the approach. Yeah. Everything is so so different." But that yeah. is a general consensus, and there is. Um, and one, you'd agree with this. Um, there's a Southeast Asian airline, and you can you can get their emergency checklists off the internet. Where their ditching procedure, it's all about the PA. What you're going to tell the passengers? <laughs> there's nothing about your configuration. I just can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, the flight attendants deal with that. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, so, to my knowledge, only it's probably only sort of. P3 drivers that are that are taught to ditch airplanes. There's no, mm -hmm. you know, there was a big section in our, you know, what do we call it? NATOPS or something. Um, about ditching hand dinner. And we used to practice it in the simulator. So it came to fruition when I had to do it. So, but I'm, I'm surprised that other people are just not interested. Yeah. Not interested. Yeah. All the airplanes I flew in the Air Force, they had ejection seats. And that was the <laughs> preferred method. <laughs> <laughs> Get that like <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny, and and you know, we used to fly in the North Sea. I was I flew out of the UK for a while, and we did a lot of stuff in the North Sea. And there, in most of the year, you have to wear a poopy suit because the water's so cold. If you get in the water, um, you're you it, and it's you don't have an awful lot of time yourself, but it's your hands. You hard you have just a few minutes before your hands are clubs and you're not able yes. to. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's a very hostile environment at times, you know, or even like when I used to fly the air jets at forty five thousand feet and it's so hostile up there, it's incredible. And the time of useful consciousness was about six seconds or something. So and people don't realise you've got to be on the J O B all the time. Yeah. Well and the Lear also had an issue with uh, you're pretty. You just didn't have a large stall margin, either direction. Yeah, yeah. So, what they call it, coffin corner or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, but the Lear, you know, um, we use them out here on uh, freight runs, and I I understand we had two Lear jets. There were the only Lears in the world with an overhead hatch over the cockpit over the uh, FO. Because that's how much there was no other escape hatches. No. Uh, interesting. Fascinating. So, well, thanks for joining us, Rod. We appreciate it. It was a great story, and uh, hopefully, yeah. maybe people can hear that. So, thank you, thank you, guys. Thank you very much for your time and listening to my story. I, I really, really appreciate it, and I follow you guys on YouTube, etc. So it's 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 really good, and it's nice chatting with you personally. It really is. Yeah. So thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Huh? Thanks, Juan. You're uh, when do you go back to work? Uh, I got a Sydney run at the end of the month. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pity I'm not over in. Pity I'm not over in Sydney. Otherwise, I'd drop in and. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Up with that. Share a beer. Yeah. If you ever get to Adelaide, yeah, give us a hoi. All right. Sounds good. All right. Okay. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks very much. We'll see you. Cheers.